Welcome to Mustang Baptist Church this morning and a little nasty outside, but, uh, you know, we won't melt, so it's all right. I'd, I'd rather be here than anywhere else, you know, today. Um, uh, it's good to see everyone here, and as far as announcements go, we're going to have a business meeting after, right after the service, and then the Mustang Women's Mission Group. Uh, we really need to come up with a name for that, but um, we're going to meet Tuesday at Miss Betty's house at 10 o'clock and then at 5 o'clock, and we're supposed to be studying numbers, so we got to read numbers, and uh, we're going to start taking up for the Annie Armstrong uh, North uh, Texas, uh, North American Missions offering uh, next week, so uh, um, if you want to give to that, that sure helps our North... Um, American Missions, and just mark your envelope, Annie Armstrong. And then the Hosea Bible Studies at Saturdays at the Hernandez home. And the Gamblers Anonymous meet at Sundays at 10 at the First United Methodist Church in Denton. And uh, <clears throat> if you know of anybody that needs that service. And our food pantry, we've been giving food out. And if you know of anybody that needs food or is sick, maybe and needs some help, with food, just uh, let Carol or Maureen or Lois Ann or Betty Smith know. And then uh, the Hilltop University Conference, I think we've got six people going, six or seven, I can't remember. So that is, that is great. I'm excited about that. I think they'll really enjoy it. We, we have to find somebody that will drive them there in the van. So be praying about it and thinking about it. <laughs> um, and in, in way of uh, prayer request, uh, Becky gave a praise a while ago. She had to go to Georgia for, for her job, and she said, I made it home safe. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so, but Thelma, her sister-in-law, was sick, so uh, they were going to stay home with her. And uh, <clears throat> Vicki and, and Becky, uh, Vicki and Danny Beckham, uh, their little uh, dog, little bit, uh, today I think maybe they, he will be going home. They've had him for about 17 years, and so they were staying home with him. Pray for them. This is, this is hard. This was their part of their family. And Tona wasn't feeling real well today, so we need to remember her. And uh, so is there anyone else? Any praises? Absolutely. I got here through all the phones, <laughs> and Jesus' angel helped me. I don't know why. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Junior, oh, uh, well, go ahead, Lori. Uh huh. We shouldn't judge, should we? Do not judge. People. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. And, uh, okay. Wonderful testimony to what so far. Well, uh, Lori and uh, David went to see the Jesus Revolution movie and recommended it. So uh, if any of you get a chance to go, uh, you need to go watch it. And uh, we, Junior and I went to the uh, Denton Freedom House Gala. Uh, Friday night. It's the first time we've gotten to go, and it was really a blessing. I tell you, it was, uh, it really was, to see how God is working in these people, these broken people's lives. And the uh, one reason it's so special to us is because um, Junior's stepmother, her granddaughter, is was one of the residents there. And I mean, it, she was. She's going down, and God got a hold of her and turned her around, and she's a totally different person. So we got to see her and her mom and her dad and, uh, and her grandmother and, well, even her aunt and uncle uh, that we hadn't seen in a while. And uh, so it was a real blessing and, uh, and just to see how God can work in these lives. And we are so thankful for the men and women and the volunteers that help with Denton Freedom House. It's just a... Uh, they're an awesome group. Anything else? Well, I'll lead us in a word of prayer. 
Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity and the privilege that we can come together in your house this morning, Lord. And there's so many that don't have this uh, privilege and uh, to meet together to worship you and honor you and glorify you. And we are thankful. And I thank you for Mustang Baptist Church and ask you to continue to lead and guide us in all that we do. Just be with Brian this morning as he prepares for the message. Just speak through him and use him, Lord, and be with Steve and Margie as they lead us in music worship. And I pray for George now and the other Sunday school teachers. Just give them the words to say, Father, that we can hear more about your love and what you want us to do in our lives. Thank you for your blessings and for your watch care. And we pray that you would just be with each and every one on our prayer list. And Lord, you know how long it is. And there's so many that are hurting and uh, need your help. And we just ask you to meet their needs. Just thank you for your love and for dying on the cross for me. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning, good morning. It's always so good to be able to, to come here and just be here with family, with the joy that, that God gives us in each other. It is a gift. And, you know, I, I, I'm with Vernon at the, the, the event on Friday night. Uh, was such a gift because... They said something there that was absolutely, but absolutely uh, just magnificent. They're not there to heal those who are on drugs or have these problems in the way that the world heals them. They're not there to bring them to doctors and, 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 and psychologists and psychiatrists to help them get through their problems. They have one simple mission, to share the gospel. And in sharing the gospel, they disciple these young men and women who are hurting, who are broken. Not much different from what it was in the 60s when they had that Jesus revolution. Pao and I had the opportunity to listen to Chuck Smith many, many times as he came to Hawaii to his churches in Calvary. We had many opportunities to sit down and and talk with him. His love for people, his love for the children of God was beyond question. His desire was to see them come to salvation. And his first time in his church, when they first started to come through those doors, hippies, no shoes, kind of filthy. And the people in the church, very much like us here, saw them coming in and said, ooh, why are they coming here? Do we really need their kind here? And Chuck Smith took a basin out, poured water into it, walk to the back, and wash their feet. That is the gift of the gospel. That is what we're called to be, right? To be God's love in this place where there is no love, where those children fall to drugs, who get addicted to, to, to all kinds of things, who, who are hurting and, and are depressed because the world teaches them that they don't matter, that they have no meaning, that they don't have anything bigger or greater than themselves. When you think about that, when you think about kids who are being abused from the very young age, we had one come to our table and told us what it was like. It breaks your heart. Children should not have to go through this. Jesus cried when he looked at that spot where Lazarus lay and saw the tears and the pain of the people 
who were experiencing death in this world. It was never meant to be that way. But all it took for one man to do was to wash the feet and teach his congregation that that person is why we're here. For the sick, for the infirmed, for the dead and the dying. That's our purpose. That's what we are all about. And when we come to the word so many times, we sit in front of it, and we look to read. It's <sighs> got to be more than that. It's got to be so much more. It's, it should be a heart fully given, prepared to receive. As Spurgeon would say, to come before the king and to sit at his knees and listen to what he has to say to us so that we could know him, right? That is the purpose. What is our purpose when we read? Larry, what, do we, what is our purpose when we go into his word? It's a shadow. Yeah. It's about becoming more and more like him. But we can't do that unless we know him. A husband and a wife cannot truly have a, a close, intimate relationship without having a strong communication, a strong uh, sense of being together. You can't just wing it. It's what we mostly do. We wing it. Sir. Because it's about relationship. It's about that, that intimacy that you have with them, as you put it, fellowship. Uh, I think this must be a, an even more incredible word for that. I have to find it. Yeah. I'm probably going to have to find it in the Greek or in the, in the Hebrew because it is it's so much more. We need to come to a place where we see him and look to him, and learn from him, and gather from him, and then walk with him like Enoch walked with him. Enoch didn't start walking with him until he was 65 and had Methuselah. That says a lot. And that also tells us what we can do, who we can be. We can be those who walk with him, who give ourselves fully to him, right? And his word is the beginning and the end. <laughs> well, his word is Christ. And in everything, we have to remember to have time with him. He told the Ephesians, you've lost your first love in Revelation 2. 
you lost your first love. I, you do so many good things. You listened when, I, when Paul told you not to trust all that you hear, not to, to follow all these so-called Christians that have their own doctrine. But in becoming involved in the work of the church, in becoming involved in the ministries of the church, you put me outside. You left me on the chair and you don't come to me. You don't see me. You don't be, have a part in me. Yes, you know my word. Knowing the word is not enough. Knowing the word is the beginning. So when I come to Ephesians and I start looking at this, my first question is, Lord, what am I to, to do with this? How am I to know you better in, this, in this, these verses that you provide me? What am I supposed to do? Because the purpose is to know him, to understand what he wants, and how it is that we can please him. And as we walk and please him, how do we build that into our lives? Knowing, understanding, and wisdom. The three go together, but they're separate. It begins with knowing him. It begins with understanding who he is in us and how, what is it that we're supposed to do to meet whatever it is that we've, we are now coming to understand he requires of us. And then how do we take that understanding and build it into a lifestyle, muscle memory? Muscle memory is so important. My wife brings that up to me all the time. Read less, do more. Could read all day long. Boy, do I have the time. But if I don't apply, what good does it do me? And this is not, this is for me more than to anybody else. He, he, when, wherever I come here, I know that I am speaking to myself in the mirror. Because it's what he wants me to see and to understand. Last time we talked about Ephesians, we kind of took a, a side route to show how in Ephesians, we hit Psalm 27 and how God already had a plan of something that he was preparing for us. And as we go back to Ephesians, and we'll touch quickly because we only get a limited amount of time. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 says, According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That is the work of of the Spirit in us, and that is what we're supposed to be. It's about God's love. It's about Christ in us that allows us to be holy, hagios, separated, sanctified, pure, single-minded, and without blame, spotless. Because he has provided for us, as I pointed out in Psalm 27, Having predestinated us or preordained for us to adoption, to the opportunity to become his children. And that is through his foreknowledge. His foreknowledge. And, and we don't see this, and I pointed this out the last time, that we have to go to Romans 8, uh, 28. Uh, 8, 28 through 30, to see how this is laid out. I don't know the mind of God. I could never really truly understand it all. I am looking forward to the day that he brings us home and I can have time with him. Because I then am told that I will know him as I am known because now I see him the way he is, no longer the way 
that we see through this tinted glass of ours. But he, through his foreknowledge, he predetermined, he pro to us. He set for us an opportunity to know him. And that's for all, not just for some. He didn't just pick and choose. Yes, sir. I, 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 told, I told Pablo one day, I said, Pablo, we're already in heaven. For God has no time. There is no time with him. We have to pass through this layer by layer, day by day, moment by moment. <laughs> but God knows the beginning from the end. He already knew. He put in us, every single person on this earth was made in his image. There is something within us that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned, when they trespassed, when they turned away, when they rebelled. But in us, there is still there. And we saw it with Abel and Cain. Abel wanted to do that which God would have him do. And God accepted his sacrifice. Cain decided, I will not. I will do it my way. I will do it in accordance to how I see it. I think it's good. It should be fine with God. But it wasn't. And God said, if you do well, won't you be accepted? But watch out. Sin is at the door. <sighs> master it, or it will master you. It will master us if we do not. And if it becomes our master, we become slaves to sin. And what's, what's the penalty for sin, uh, Verna? Death. Death is what we have to look forward to, but not just any death. A death of total separation from the king. A total separation from the light. A total separation from the one who created us. A darkness that goes beyond anything we can imagine. Pain that we don't understand. He foreknew us because in our hearts he set into place a way for the dead to choose. He didn't give us choice for no reason. He gave us an opportunity to choose. One third of the angels chose against him. Adam chose against him. I'm sure afterwards he re-examined that thought, that choice, because he taught his children it is the father that teaches the children. It is the father who leads the family. It is the father who, who, who provides the washing, the cleansing for the bride. It is Jesus who bled and washed his bride clean. So we, in us, there is an innate desire either to be with him as Abel or to turn away as Cain. It's in us. But he knew this. He knew everything about us from before the foundations of the earth were even made. And he provided a way. And it's not an easy way. It's a very narrow road. A narrow road that's compressed, that has so much on it that that will cause us some pain, some suffering, some hurt. Because did he not 
have pain and hurt? Did they not hate him? If they hated him, do they, we think we're going to be loved? James says that we should not have friendship with the world. Because to have friendship with the world is to be at enmity with God. It is to be separated from him. It is to be turning away from him. Look at the northern kingdom of Israel. Oh, we just went through ten verses this Saturday. They turn from him. And we want, they want, everybody wants to blame their leaders. Oh, Jeroboam did this. Oh, this one did that. And oh, they could have done the better. No. They chose to walk away. It was convenient for them to walk away. It was convenient for them to turn away. So they went. They followed after Baal and the gods of those people. And it cost them. It cost them their nation. It cost them their lives. It cost them their families. It cost them everything. Will they return? Yes. Because not all of them stayed in the northern kingdom. Many had followed and gone back to the southern kingdom. There are no such things as ten lost tribes. They're all there. And Isaiah, I mean Elijah, when he comes, he will choose. He will show each one where they belong, who they belong to, which tribe, and he will choose 144,000 of them to go out into the world and rejoice because Jesus will be given to everyone they come in contact with who belong to him, whose heart will change, whose heart will choose. God says, I, I would that everyone would come that they would choose life and not death. But they don't. But that doesn't change our task. That doesn't change the fact that we need to be providing that gift. The same way Denton Freedom House does. The gift of Christ to everyone. He said, they asked him the question, how many come out of this? What's the percentage to come out of this successfully? And he answered it beautifully. He said, our task is to give the gospel to all of them. And 100% of them get the gospel. The world may look at it the other way. But how many of them come out feeling better and doing well? doesn't matter. They receive the gospel. That's their purpose. Their purpose is to provide the gospel and to disciple. No one not everyone will come to Christ. Period. You know, even a good example with ten lepers. You know, God, I mean, Jesus healed all of them, but only one came back. Does that mean they all received healing? Yeah. All received, but not all were grateful. Not all were thankful. When he says that we are to be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, that we should... Uh, and thanksgiving by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. When we ask, do we give thanks? When we pray for the needs of those around us, do we give thanks? (laughs) You look at this. Peter tells us that the elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification through the process of hagiasmos, which is to purify, to consecrate, to to, uh, bring to holiness. That's what sanctification is. It is to change this life and bring it into what? The image of the master. To make us more and more like him. That is the purpose of the Spirit. He guides us, he leads us, he keeps, he never talks of himself. You'll never see this, the, the, the Holy Spirit talk about himself. 
It's always pointing to Christ. It's always pointing to the one who saved us. It's always pointing to the one who gave himself for us. It's always pointing to the word of God. It's always talking about his majesty, our king. And our purpose, what he does is he molds, he helps mold us by giving us. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for he gives us the strength and the will to do. So and none of it comes from us. So here's where we come to the one that we didn't do anything yet with. And that is Ephesians 1, 6, and 7. Verna, can you read Ephesians 1, 6, and 7? So God provided for us a place in his son. You're going to find the word in, in Christ, in his son, in, in him. You're going to see this over and over again in this, in the beloved. You're going to see this over and over again in Ephesians, at least 20 some odd times. Why? Because it's all about him and the work he has done. None of it is about us. None of it. We say, but we chose. We received. We were given an opportunity. We saw the, the, that, that buoy that's thrown into the water to save us as we were drowning. And all we did was grab it. <laughs> that's what we're doing here. And it's what? To the praise and glory of his grace. Whose grace? The Father's. The Father's grace is His grace that He has provided us. It is that praise and glory. That has made us accepted. The word that he uses for is karatuo. Karatuo is, is a word that, that we see as accepted. Accepted sounds really interesting and simple, it's direct. But it's not deep enough to understand the magnitude of what he has done for us. It's a special honor. A special honor to receive something that we have not earned. He, he is giving us a special honor. He has provided us in a way that we have become highly favored. It's it's beyond just accept it. We have been highly favored. We have been provided a special honor in his acceptance of us by grace through Christ Jesus. Always in his beloved. Always in what he has done. Always it's about God. Yes, sir. Different. My, my brother was a Vietnam veteran. And he came back and he struggled with alcohol. And he was alcohol, he was alcohol. Fortunately, he's back a couple of years. But he prayed for the Lord. God delivered him from alcohol, right? And praise God. A few years later, he was right back here. And this time, he prayed a different prayer. And, and God said, This did not take that alcohol. Every day he wakes up, he has to make a conscious decision not to drink. But now he's Even though they had an infirmity, 
yeah. Because we're looking at with this. We're looking at the physical. We're looking at the life we see outside. What we need to be seeing is what God sees through the eyes of our Lord. And that can only come in love. That's how we can be holy without blame. Because in love, we start to see past the front, the past, the skin. And we start to look for things that tell us they're hurting. They are in need. We saw that during the dinner when she spoke to us. The pain was great inside. The fight is, it's a fire there. It's a firefight. It's like being at the Tet Offensive and suddenly having all these people coming at you, shooting at you from all directions, and all you could do is get up there under the machine gun and, and shoot out, hoping you hit something that stops this madness. That's how we're supposed to see. Through his eyes. And he gives us that ability. But we have to be open to hear we have to be open to listen because there's a purpose. He made us accept it and he redeemed us. Apolutrosis It's deliverance. It's a ransom that is paid in full. That's what the redemption means. It's paid in full. What did he say to Telestai? Paid in full. It's an accounting term in the Roman time. When he was on the cross and he finished, they, they like to put, it is finished. He said at the end, it is finished. No, he said to Telestai. It is paid in full, Father. He paid, he redeemed us. He gave it all for us. And in it, that, and that word, is the root word is apoluo, which is to be pardoned, to free fully, to relieve totally, to dismiss, to take it all. And he gives us forgiveness. He gives us deliverance. He gives us a pardon. We don't deserve it. All have failed. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. So when we start thinking that we are something different, as Chuck Smith's church may have thought at one point, when that man came in, that hippie and his family or his friends, we're no different. We're just as filthy. But we're covered by the blood of the king. And that is the gift that goes beyond anything we can imagine. He tells us that for by grace we have been, you know, in, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not what we do. See, the world and all the religions of the world are built again about, around the basis of works. Every single one of them. Take a good look. Only Christianity is based on the work of the king. Only Christianity is based on what he has done, not what we do. Every other one, you have to work to bring him down to you. <laughs> we have, as we said, we have some, some real uh, ideas that are so beyond lost. But he gave us his grace. He paid the price to save us, to deliver us, to protect us, to heal us, to give us peace with the Father. And that we get by faith, by peace, by trusting him, by looking to him and saying, you're everything I need. 
Abram didn't get saved before he came to a place where he said, I trust you. He believed God, and so it was accounted to him for righteousness. It's a gift that's given. It's a present. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. That's why this. You come to it, you sit at his feet, and you listen. He's going to talk to us as he spoke to you through those verses. He's going to talk to you and tell you, this is who I am. This is what I expect. For you cannot please me without faith. Without faith, there is no pleasing God. You must trust him and trust that he is and will provide for you and will give you what you need, that he will be there for you, that you can believe him, that you can know him. And in it, you can come to a place where you could understand, what would you have me do, Lord? How should I walk? How should I live? You gave me a gift. You sacrificed for me. You provided that present that I cannot pay for. So when I look at this, I think about those verses, those two verses, and think, what should we take away from this? What is it that we should receive when we listen to this? How should we be looking at this and coming to a place where we understand every single word in this is important. He said, not one yacht or one tittle shall be taken away until he all is fulfilled. Every word, every sentence, every verse matters. So what do you take away from this verse? What is he telling us? How should we be moving forward in our everyday lives when we look at these two verses? Well, he tells us. He tells us clearly that he did it all and that it was for his glory that it is done. And it is by grace and grace only and that he has made us accepted in his beloved. There's nothing we do. So when we come to the understanding that God has done it all for us, He has provided for us. He has chosen us. He has paid a place. He has developed that road. He has given us the way in which we are to move. Our purpose is to receive it with joy and gladness and begin a walk that just follows after him. The Jews didn't move from one spot to the other in the desert in those 40 years until God moved. If he stayed, they stayed. If he moved, they moved. But did all get saved at that point? No. Some chose to rebel. Some chose to look at the land and think it was too hard for them to get it because they can't trust God. Two said, my trust is in him. Do you notice the number? Two out of the 12, two out of all those people, millions, said, I will trust him. He is worthy of all trust. That's where we have to be. We have to know that he did it all, he gave it all, he provided it all, and now we can follow after him in whatever way that suits his pleasure. It is, we're at the pleasure of our king. We're at the pleasure of our Lord. We have no 
we, we're assured. We have an assurance that goes beyond anything that anyone can understand. Beyond what I understand, at least. There's so many times when I look and I feel like I'm not doing enough. I'm not giving enough. I'm not sharing enough. That's the evil one. Always in there telling him, who are you? Yeah, you're one of those that have sinned and fallen short of the grace of God, of the glory of God. But then God tells him, but I have justified you. I have provided for you. The grace has been given. Accept it. Receive it. Own it. Because the assurance is true. Our hope is absolute. So our purpose is always the same. To be a light in a dark world. To provide a cup of cold water to those who are lost and in need. Who are thirsty. That they may hear the gospel from us. That they may have the opportunity to know Christ. And then if we're really blessed, we'll have the opportunity to provide manna. To provide the, the, the word of God and disciple them. Father, we praise you and we thank you for this time. I know I went over a little, Lord, but, you know, I'm just so thankful to you for what you do in us in this church, in your people, in your children, Lord. For we are all kids of the King. Oh, Lord, we look forward to the day of your coming. We just want to be close to you. I pray, Father, that you would bless this church, bless these folks, bless everyone that comes here today, that you would provide for, for your message to come through. And clearly, through Brian today, Lord, as he shares his heart for you with us and that you share your heart for us through him. Father, I pray that you would be with Margie and, St and Steve, and, and, and I thank you for healing Steve and bringing him back in, into the house, Lord. And I praise you for the gift that, that, that each person here is to me, to my wife, and to each other. We are truly your children, your family, and we look forward to that day. If we rejoice as much as we do now here, I can only imagine what it's going to be like when we're before you. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.